Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the in lab stage. Apologies for the delay. Again, um, the joys of running a virtual and in person conference always means there's going to be little hiccups. Hopefully, you uh, manage to go and get yourself another cup of tea. Or actually, considering the time of day, maybe you've got a little glass of wine or, or a little glass of gin and tonic. That would be lovely, wouldn't it? Um, without further ado, let's go into our first session for this panel. Now, we've kind of switched around the order. So, if you're following along on the sheets, um, do bear with us. First up, we're going to have Professor Yulan He, Professor and the Deputy Head of Research at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Warwick. All these uh, sessions are going to be focused on neuroscience, which I'm really excited to hear about. Um, we're going to have Q&A in between each talk, so please do send your questions to Slido, and I will put them to each of the speakers. Without further ado, please do join me in welcoming Yulan to the stage. Thank you. Uh, right, so the talk I will uh, present today is part of my um, five-year uh, Turing AI fellow uh, ship on event-centric natural language understanding fund, find it, uh, funded by UK Research and Innovation. So the grand challenge that I uh, want to tackle in my fellowship is to build a machine reading comprehension model uh, with reasoning capabilities. Uh, for humans, successful reading comprehension uh, depends on the construction of an event structure uh, that the, um, represents what's happening in the text and often referred to as the situation model in cognitive psychology. For example, when we read news about the war in Ukraine, our minds will construct a timeline of events unrolled over time. Um, if we would like to find out the reasons behind the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, we would need the information uh, from uh, some background knowledge, and in this case, the historical events between Russia and Ukraine, in order to understand what has led to the crisis. So in machine reading comprehension, a computer could continuously build and uh, update a graph of eventualities as reading progresses. Uh, question answering could, in principle, be based on such a dynamically updated event graph. Uh, during my fellowship, I would develop a knowledge-aware and event-centric framework for language understanding, uh, in which the event graph would build as reading progresses and event uh, representations are learned with the incorporation of background knowledge. And the reading comprehension model would be uh, uh, updated uh, and also developed with the built-in interpretability and robustness against uh, adversarial attacks. So, um, okay, um, right, so um, uh, in my talk today, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, machine reasoning. And I think uh, Professor uh, Mirella Lapta from University of Edinburgh has given a very great talk this morning, talking about the summarization as a test bed uh, for machine reasoning. But in my talk uh, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to focus on three different types of machine reasoning. So the first one would be common sense reasoning for dialogue in motion de detection. Um, and the second one would be event semantic reasoning for event-centric question answering. And the last one would be evidence reasoning for claim veracity assessment. Um, so I will start with um, common sense reasoning for dialogue emotion detection. Now suppose you are Rachel in conversation with uh, Phoebe and Ross. Now Phoebe suggests going out um, in the weekend but Ross couldn't go uh, because he has to work. Now, how should you respond in this uh, scenario? Now, using the common sense knowledge that Saturday means rest, Phoebe will be able to sense the sad, emo uh, sorry, uh, Rachel will be able to sense the sad emotion of Ross, and therefore, she would respond um, with the sympathy that that was uh, too bad. So in this uh, particular example, we can see that common sense knowledge uh, is required in order to infer the emotion expressed in human dialogues. So um, however, I mean, in order to build a dialogue emotion detection system, we need to be able to uh, consider historical dialogue uh, 
context. For example, the second utterance uh, omit the phrase this weekend, and the last utterance that has a code reference relation with have to work. Um, we can frame this uh, problem as a sequence labeling uh, problem in which given a sequence of utterances, we would like to infer the emotion uh, sequence, label sequence. And we can resort to transformer encoder decoder architecture here uh, because transformer is natural to capture the historical contextual information. Now to um, capture the the uh, common sense knowledge, what we can do here is uh, we can rely on a common, external common sense knowledge base, and in this case would be the atomic. So in atomic, the nodes represent events, and the edges representing the relation connecting two events. So for the utterance, I have to work on Saturday. What we can do is that we can search atomic knowledge base, find the most relevant events, um, and then we can identify the speaker's intention, reaction, and also other's reaction uh, in order to retrieve the common sense knowledge. Now, once we have uh, this set of common sense knowledge, we can combine them and then through a, a pooling or attention, and we can integrate with the other representation to finally come up with the final representation. Now, this is just a one possible um, approach that we can retrieve common sense knowledge from the knowledge base. Now, alternatively, what we can do is uh, we can generate the knowledge using pre-trained language model on atomic. In this case, the uh, input utterance uh, would be used as the head event, and then pair with the desirable relation type. We fit into language model pre-trained on the atomic knowledge base, generate the and common sense knowledge. And we can do so for any other types of relations we are interested in. So once we have uh, all this uh, knowledge uh, obtained from different routes, then what we can do is that uh, we can use a gating mechanism to exclusively choose, select from one of the knowledge. So at the end, I mean, that would be the, the final set of a common sense knowledge used for the emotion reasoning. Now here we can see the impact of incorporating the common sense knowledge. So given a dialogue, now suppose we want to find out the emotion of the last utterance. Oh my God, you are a freak. Now without using any common sense knowledge, the model will erroneously uh, infer the mad uh, emotion and then this is wrong. However, what we can do here is uh, we can make use of the common sense knowledge relating to the person A's in uh, reaction, intention, and also person B's reaction. And we can further use the attention mechanism to identify the most salient knowledge. And in this case, we can see that the model correctly identified the happy and satisfying to be most important common sense knowledge for emotion inference. And the model would be able to infer the correct joyful emotion in this dialogue. Now in the second part of my talk, I'm going to uh, talk about the event semantic reasoning for event-centric question answering. Now in question answering, usually the model is given a context and paired with a question. Now a common approach here is we can uh, train a generative QA model, taking the context and question as input, and then the model will be able to generate the answer. However, what we notice here is for successful question answering, there are a number of steps need to be taken. Now first, we need to understand the question. So the question mentioned an event filing of the charge against COP. So this is the first step we need to take, identify the event mentioned in the question. Now the second thing is that we need to detect the desirable event semantic relation that the answer should have with respect to the, the, the question event. And because of the lead to Q, um, the, uh, the kind of a Q, we know that the uh, event semantic relation the model expects to be able to identify will be conditional. And finally, um, given this uh, question event and desirable semantic relation, what we need to do is that we need to identify the events in context as highlighted by um, the purple color and also uh, red color here and link this um, uh, events 
with the question event in order to generate the final answer. So at the end, we can see that the model will be able to generate the particular actions from the law enforcement, which has this condition or relation with the finding of the charges event. So we can see here, we need event semantic reasoning. Um, so what we propose is a contrastive learning approach, given the question paragraph and also the desirable event relation type, we fit into a pre-trained -pre language model. Now at the same time, we would map those events mentioned in questions and also mentioned in paragraph through some transformation matrix, map them into some event embedding space. Now what we hope to do here is to push those uh, uh, answer events and question event to be closer with each other as highlighted by uh, the blue color and also red color here and push them away from other events. And at the same time, we would also uh, train a multi-layer perception to classify or to detect the event relation type and train the model to generate the final answer. Now we can see um, evaluation results here. Uh, we compare our approach, uh, which is represented by these uh, yellow bars, uh, compared with the pre-trained language model. And we can see that across five different event semantic relation types, our model uh, gives much better performance in terms of the overlapping between the answer event and question event. And we can also see some of the example output generated by the model. So from the, the answer generated from the pre-trained language model, what we can see here is that none of the answers, uh, I mean, in this case, the model generates three answers. So none of those answers overlap with the ground truth answer. On the contrary, our approach will be able to generate the answers which has 100% um, overlap with the ground truth answer. So we can see that using the contrastive uh, learning, we are able to reason better about the event semantic relations between the answer events and also the question events. While the traditional prediction language model would not have the capability to do this uh, proper event semantic reasoning. Now, in my last part of a talk, uh, I'm going to um, present evidence reasoning approach for claim veracity assessment. Now, a claim veracity assessment problem uh, is given a claim, for example, vitamin C cures COVID-19, we would like to retrieve the set of relevant evidence, and we want to identify the relationship between the evidence and claim, so whether the evidence refute or support the, uh, the claim and in order to reach the final verdict. Um, so in this case, we can see that we need to perform evidence reasoning. Now, apart from identifying the relationship between the evidence and claim, we could also identify the major topics discussed in uh, claim and also discussed in evidence as highlighted by the words in red color here. So those are the topic words. And what we want to do here is that we want to maintain the topic coherence between the evidence and the claim, and also uh, hopefully there will be some uh, topic co uh, coherence across different evidence. In this example, we can see that evidence one and two, they are topically more relevant with the claim compared to evidence three. So we propose an approach called topic aware reasoning. Uh, in which we can pair the claim with each piece of evidence. We fit into some context encoder, generate the hidden representation. And at the same time, we also fit claim and all the retrieved evidence into some topic model to infer the global topic shared by the claim and also the evidence, as well as the topic from the individual claim or evidence. And then we need to perform some topic coherence measurement to make sure the evidence will be topically coherent with the claim and also the relevant uh, evidence, uh, they will have a topical coherence across uh, each other. And then we can uh, incorporate this uh, so-called topic attention score to generate the final representation, fit into classification network, generate the final classification output. Now we can see an example output here 
given a claim, and we retrieve five uh, evidence. However, we can see that the top two evidence, they are topically more relevant with the claim. And the last two pieces of, of evidence, they are topically irrelevant with the claim. And the center one, the evidence tree, basically is more ambiguous. Now, with our reasoning model, taking into account this uh, topic-aware attention, we are able to generate the final refute uh, decision. Uh, apart from using the textual evidence, we can also make use of the, the clues from images. Now, in this uh, particular case, we propose an approach to perform this uh, multimodal fake news detection in which we, are, we aim to classify the news as either re reliable or unreliable. Now, here we show um, the uh, heat map of the attentions on the image as well as on text. So text uh, highlighted with the blue color denotes the words or the image uh, regions will be highly, uh, highly relevant with the unreliable class. While the uh, words highlighted in red color or the image patches highlighted in red color denotes those uh, regions uh, which are highly correlated with uh, reliable uh, category. We can see that the name Anthony Fortry would be highly relevant to this reliable category. However, the viewpoint expressed by Anthony in this interview, uh, in this case, um, uh, shutdown will damage America. Now, we can see that the word damage is highly relevant with unreliable category, and the model would be successfully uh, predict the um, unreliable class label for this particular case. So um, I'll just give you a very quick uh, overview of uh, three kind of pieces of uh, work we have on uh, machine reasoning for language understanding. We are still uh, face a range of uh, different challenges. So the first challenge is how to model the state change of events and event relation dynamics. Because the attributes relating to event, they are not static, they, they change over time. For example, the UK growth rate uh, would be different at different point of time. And also, uh, you know, uh, with the incorporation of uh, some other events, the event cost relation might change as well. And on the other hand, we also need to have a certain way to represent the event graph in different granularity level. For example, uh, if we say COVID-19 um, would cause the economy slow down, we have uh, this uh, more abstract level of cost relations of the events. However, if we say something like the UK's economic will be slowed, slowed down significantly due to COVID, then we have this instance level uh, causal relation. So we need to build the event graph in different granular uh, levels. There's also the um, a challenge of uh, uh, distilling the implicit knowledge automatically while reading progresses. And this is largely um, lacked in the current NLP approaches. And finally, we need to have a certain way to build the robustness into the machine reading comprehension model and also offer a different level of interpretability depending on the stakeholders. So that uh, ends my talk. I would like to express my, um, uh, basically like thank all my uh, group members and also my collaborators who contributed to the work I presented today. And I'm happy to take questions. Um, so I'm just going to the Slido now to see if, um, what questions we have. The first one we've got from Anna. Um, an interesting question. Um, is machine reasoning advanced enough to be able to tell if someone is lying, for example, for criminal investigations? Um, I, I guess this will be quite hard. I mean, at the moment, the machine reasoning is still largely built on the data-driven approach. So basically, we rely on you know, like the sufficient large number of uh, data and then in order to train some reliable model to be able to perform the reasoning. So in this uh, particular case, I guess, usually like, you know, in order to train the model, you need to have a ground truth label, right? I guess it would be very hard to collect the data in this uh, regard. Um, you so, have to have something to compare it to in terms of the evidence. And, and yeah, so yes, as in, you, as indeed. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And another question for you before we wrap up. What's your sort of vision for this research? You know, where, where are you hoping to go with it and where would you most like to see it being used? 
Uh, so, I mean, the, this uh, machine reasoning, um, typically, it just like you refer to, you know, whether we have a certain way to automatically acquire the knowledge, uh, you know, in appropriate manner, and then to use this uh, knowledge in order to understand the meaning in language. So we have uh, made this uh, initial attempt, uh, basically, you know, uh, in, in a range of uh, different areas. What we are hoping to achieve uh, next is actually uh, you know, rather than just uh, building some statistical models and then with uh, this incorporation of the external knowledge, we are also looking into some different ways in acquiring the knowledge and also, you know, uh, different ways in incorporating this uh, knowledge into the reasoning process. So I think that more recently there has been some discussion around this uh, course uh, model learning. So that's, a uh, you know, kind of a... Uh, you know, next level of statistical model learning. So that would be, I guess, would be a kind of, a, you know, a promising direction to go. And one final question from the, um, from the Slido. Um, how are you scoring the quality of the data that forms part of the knowledge graph, i.e. how to filter misinformation and prevent impacts further down the line? So I think this is relating to data bias problem, right? So for any, like, data we use, so there might be some data inaccuracy and data bias. We are still like looking into sensible solutions. I mean, this is a hard problem. Of course, of yeah. course. Well, as you outlined at the end of your presentation, lots of challenges, but lots of opportunities for some great research to come. Um, I hope everyone will join me in thanking Yulan for a really fascinating presentation today. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to our next presentation uh, for today. And again, sorry for the, the changes in order. I think we're going to go straight to uh, Damien, Professor Damien Coyle, who's going to be giving us a virtual presentation. Um, Damien is Professor of Neurotechnology and Director of the Intelligent Systems Research Centre at Ulster University's McGee Campus. Over to you, Damien. Good evening, everyone. Um, very, very pleased to be here to present uh, some of our research on AI-enabled wearable neurotechnology. And really it's focusing around decoding electroencephalography or EEG uh, brainwaves in a brain-computer interface. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the basics of brain-computer interfaces. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about applications in spinal injury, brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder. If I have time, I'll cover some more advanced uh, brain-computer interface uh, things that we're doing in the lab and talk a little bit about the challenges and prospects for, for BCIs and neurotechnology. One message I would like to relay is that BCI control is a learned skill. It's not simply a matter of mind reading, and this has really three pillars. It really involves training the individuals who are using the brain-computer interface over multiple sessions of repetition. It also has an application focus, so it's more important to have an applied area, such as a communication device for somebody who cannot communicate or a rehabilitation device. And then obviously the AI and machine learning plays a big part in learning from, from brain activity. So those three pillars along with big data are very important. Hopefully this talk will emphasize that. So I'm going to focus on motor imagery BCIs or brain computer interfaces. And it looks something like this, where a person uh, relays an intent by modulating brain activity. And that modulation could be done through, for example, imagined movement. Uh, so the imagined movement modulates signals in the motor cortex. We try to pick those modulations up or detect them and translate them into an action or a control signal. I'm very much focused on non-invasive EEG, so we measure signals at the surface of the scalp uh, outside the, the skull, um, and we're not looking at invasively recorded uh, signals. So we use motor imagery, and we, there's a number of reasons for doing so. Uh, it's very well defined spatially what happens when uh, you perform imagine movement or, or execute a movement. So for example, right arm movement, you get changes on the left hand side, left arm movement changes on the right hand side and foot movement right in the center. So this is quite important. Um, the spatial distinction between the different uh, imagined movements. In addition, we have a lot of spectral differences. So for example, whenever we have no movement happening, we, our motor cortex is at rest, you would see a lot of this uh, mu rhythm here, which is a slow frequency. Uh, whenever we perform movement, that rhythm disappears on the opposite side and we get more of this faster component. So we know spectrally and spatially what happens when movement is performed or imagine movement importantly. 
It's also a skill that you can develop. You can get better at doing motor imagery. You can get better at modulating your brain activity by learning through feedback. Um, and that's very important as well. Just as we learn to control our motor cortex as a child, uh, to grasp a toy, you can control, learn to control your motor cortex and modulate brain activity for brain computer interface tasks. And if we're going to associate brain computer interface with tasks that are associated with movement, um, such as prosthetic limbs or movement on a, on a screen, it makes sense to use motor related activity in a brain computer interface. However, with all that information about spatial and spectral content, there still is a lot of variation across many individuals due to fatigue and day-to-day and -day variability, um, differences between individuals, and then non-stationarity caused by background brain activity. And these are very difficult to, to deal with sometimes. So we use multiple stages of signal processing to uh, uh, achieve differences and, and find those subtle differences between different brain responses to mental tasks. I'm not gonna spend any time uh, talking about this, the details of this framework, but um, basically to say that we take multiple signals from the brain and translate them into what we call a control signal that moves up for left arm movement imagination and down for right arm movement imagination. Uh, and we normally record multiple repetitions of a person doing the imagination, so they get a cue here three seconds. And they may be asked to imagine lifting a weight with the right arm and keep that going for a number of seconds and do that repetitively in response to these cues. And if, if, we, if we collect that data then from say 100 trials, 50 left arm movements, 50 right arm movements, we look at the accuracy then and distinguishing that right across the duration of the trial. So in this baseline period, we expect to see 50% accuracy when they're not doing any movements. This is the baseline. And then when they do perform movements at some point after the, the initiation of the imagined movement, the uh, accuracy peaks and then drops off. So this, this measure I'll mention a number of times during this, uh, during this presentation, it's a very important measure. So this is, this is the system in action. We have 32 channels of EEG here, and that's that control signal that I mentioned that varies between one and minus one. Uh, it's linked to this character in the game, which, which moves from left to right in response to um, stimuli that are presented on the screen. So for example, this, this axon, this character, this virtual axon, and spike carrying up the action has to be collected by the play, player playing the game. Um, and so you can see the level of control of this individual was quite good. Importantly here, you've got cues left and right of the screen, which means we can collect data whilst the person is playing the game. And they can also learn from this feedback so they can perfect their strategy. And this is quite important because there is a, a human machine learning uh, that, that goes on in brain computer interface. Um, and feedback is necessary to, to improve the learning ability of users. And we normally start off around maybe 70% accuracy and we see that going up. Uh, so we collect data, uh, the algorithms have to learn modifications in the user states and so on. So it's a, it's a human uh, machine learning uh, process, mutual learning. Feedback is very important in that, real-time feedback of the brain response. Some patients we work with uh, we are un unaware if they can see, uh, they close their eyes during the experiment. So we use auditory feedback as well as the visual feedback. So rather than present presenting a character in a game moving left to right, we present sounds that are panned left to right in the stereo, stereo feedback. Uh, sometimes those sounds are pink noise, which is easy to localize in space. Sometimes they're uh, musical genres from different, uh, like this palette of musical genres. So just talk about the first application of this technology that uh, I want to discuss, and that is uh, using the technology to compete at Cybathlon. So this is Owen, uh, who's a spinal injured for over 30 years, and he competed in, in Switzerland and Austria in, in a competition called Cybathlon, where there's six different races, and, and one of those races is a brain computer interface race where spinal injured pilots compete against each other, controlling their brain activity to, to do this task here, basically where this is this is Owen in a, in a hotel room in, in, in Graz in Austria. So Owen has to send commands to this game, uh, three three different commands, left, left movement, right movement, and um, turn on the lights. Uh, and there are also a no control state. So there's four states that Owen has to produce to, to try and control this. And as you can see, if you produce the wrong state, you're penalized in the game. So it's quite challenging. The objective is to get to the end of the, the track the quickest. Uh, and we, we, we take this using a, a four class classifier, plus two, four two class classifiers using advanced signal process. And again, 
And then we have to make the, the determination of which class is active currently, uh, which command the user intends to send, are they in a task versus a, a relaxed mode, um, and do they hold that command for a certain length of time, and make sure when a command is issued that no interruptions occur for, for a certain length of time as well. So quite a complicated framework for classifiers, left versus right, left versus feet, feet versus right, and task versus relax. So here we see that the, the race times in, in 2019 during a training phase, so multiple sessions occurred in, in different locations. And we can see that the race times drove right down to be very competitive, both in 2019 and 2020 for this, this pilot. Uh, we, we came third in 20, 20, um, 2019. However, our race day performance were mainly not competitive. And you can see here that the times went up during these last few sessions leading up to the actual race day. And we put that down to maybe heightened arousal arising from the competition day pressure on the pilot. So there was a change in, in frequency and, and, and certain uh, rest and state brain activity, which, which, was, which was very difficult to deal with on both of these occasions. So we, we agree that uh, maintaining consistent cognitive states is of critical importance. We would have a much better regime to try and uh, uh, you know, pay attention to that in future races and then have more AI strategies involved in autonomous, autonomously adapting. But for this was a very, very rewarding experience for, for Owen, uh, as I say. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about another Owen now who, who I met in 2012 and, and was what was in a condition known as minimally conscious state. So this is a state where it's very unclear uh, what level of awareness a, a, a person has because they cannot move to communicate. Owen had a brain injury and hadn't communicated with anybody for, for quite a number of years before I met him. Uh, and he's got this, what, what's known as a disorder of consciousness. So in this unresponsive wakefulness condition or minimally conscious condition is, is, is a range of consciousness that's very difficult to detect. Uh, locked in syndrome is where we're, we're quite aware that the, the person is conscious, they just cannot move to communicate. So clinicians are very keen to, to get better ways of assessing patients in these conditions. Typical approach is to use a, a behavioral based motor response um, to questions or to, to stimuli. And sometimes this is not very possible and, and uh, diagnosis is, is, is incorrect because of that. We don't detect consciousness when somebody cannot consistently move to communicate. So we're evaluating brain computer interface to first of all determine whether we can use it to assess patients using a movement independent uh, technology, um, using that same strategy that I've just been pre presenting. Um, stage two of that study then will give is giving feedback to patients with auditory feedback over multiple sessions so they can learn to modulate uh, motor areas and sensory motor rhythms. And then we have a stage three which evaluates patient responses to closed questions. So to date, we've done 24 patients. Um, I'll just tell you that the first two stages there are very much based on, on this, the, the technology that I've, I've just presented. The third stage is the Q&A stage where we have biographical situational questions defined in different categories. And those questions are agreed with family members and so on, the yes, no, the appropriate rep, yes, no response. Then we record the, the family member reading the questions aloud. Uh, and then we play back the questions repetitively and in a random sequence to two participants and they're asked to respond by imagining one or other of the movements uh, and then we, we we look at the average response then to the questions at the end of the, the, the session so this is kind of the the sessions stage one has assessment and some feedback then we move on to stage two which is more feedback uh, and then stage three, which does feedback and Q and A. So there's four four runs in each session. Um, so all in all, we do about ten to eleven sessions with these patients. It's the largest uh, study done with this particular patient group. So out of the twenty four patients, fifteen patients made it through to, to stage uh, two um, and did the feedback, and then three patients made it through. Or sorry, twelve of those patients made it through the Q and A sessions. And the results show that patients, even in these UWS states, can hit accuracies of 70, 80 uh, percent, and that the accuracies are kind of correlated with the level of severity of the injury uh, or the, the diagnosis. So MCS performed a little bit better than UWS, LAS performed better than, than both the disorders of consciousness states, and then this able-bodied uh, subjects here performed better than, than all the, the, the patient uh, subjects. 
So, but this is this is what we would expect: more consciousness, uh, therefore potentially more uh, ability to, to modulate brain activity and understand the cues. If we look then at the question and answer uh, runs, we can see that again we've got this correlation between the, the level of severity of the injury and the, the responses. Uh, um, um, that we also see differences in in the type of questions and the, and the, the accuracies within those. These results are too early and too limited to, to have conclusive, conclusive results in terms of what types of consciousness a person might have if they respond better to different types of, of questions. But this gives you an indication of where this technology could go to, to start to cognitively profile individuals uh, and do neuropsychometric testing using movement independent BCIs. And it does provide evidence that even people that are assumed to be unaware or, or not really conscious and those UWS states can modulate brain activity and, and potentially use a brain computer interface for communication if they get sufficient training. So we're, we're undertaking a large trial in this area across the UK and Ireland, and we've got about 17 hospitals involved there, uh, and we're actively recruiting patients in these categories. So I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and alleviating symptoms with neurofeedback. So our, our, our uh, question really was how effective is neurofeedback delivered using a low cost EEG based wearable headset and the reduction of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. And we use this uh, low cost wearable neurotechnology from Neuroconcise, so it's, it's embeddable within standard headgear and um, it's, it's, it's quite easy to deploy in the field. Uh, and we did so in Rwanda with 29 participants. So we had three groups. One group get uh, standard motor imagery training, and you can see it here. Uh, another group um, used or got feedback, uh, neurofeedback. So in this group, the feedback basically involved participants regulating alpha rhythm. So they had to down regulate their alpha rhythm during the sessions. And what we expected then that, that the alpha rebound at the end of the sessions would have a positive impact on certain brain areas that would help them uh, alleviate some of the symptoms of PTSD. We also had a control group that didn't get any feedback and our, our outcome measures were clinical interviews pre and post the, the training sessions. So what we found was that the neurofeedback group had significant improvements in PTSD symptoms. Um, and this was a really, really insightful, important uh, discovery. So the research has demonstrated clinically important effects in neurofeedback training uh, and represents one of the first evidence of a neurotechnological solution for treatment of PTSD in Rwanda. We did confirm, even though the, the participants did in the, in the motor imagery, BCI group did have a reduction in some symptoms that it wasn't significant. So uh, very important that neurofeedback and down regulation of alpha was, was, was having those effects. Okay, so I don't have much time to talk through some of these other areas. Um, so we're, we're working on things like decoding three dimensional hand movements. So rather than just the classical left versus right or left versus feet. So this poses many more challenges in terms of recording, but we can measure trajectories and, and do repetitions within virtual reality. Uh, and then what we really are looking at is the, the, the correlation between decoded information from the brain and the actual physical trajectories uh, achieving. We're also doing this in lower limb movements um, and using quite complex, uh, quite advanced uh, frameworks where we have convolutional neural nets to do pitch extraction and LSTM to, to do tempo coding. And, and we can see that the correlations can get up to 90% in, in lower limb uh, movement prediction. And this has been applied in, in uh, making exoskeletons uh, assistance more, more refined and, and maybe to enhance neuroplasticity and, and stroke rehabilitation. We're also looking at things like direct speech BCIs, and this is a much more complicated uh, scenario where we, we present different cues to individuals and they have to imagine uh, speaking words that have different uh, embodiment uh, configurations or two word combinations. And what we find is that we can we can use an convolutional neural net that we can we can see that overt speech is is easier to classify than imagined speech. But even in the imagined speech speech group, we're getting you know up to sixty five percent accuracy whenever we've got um, you know in this one individual here with with the, a four class scenario. So we are picking up differences between these imagined words repeated multiple times, but it, it does present quite a number of challenges. Okay, so 
really, you know, there is quite a lot of challenges associated with brain computer interfaces, especially non invasive uh, that we, we need to deal with. Um, you know, signal to noise ratio is, is, is a challenge. The non stationarity of signals uh, caused by background brain activity and other environmental noise factors are a challenge. And then there's hardware limitations in terms of wearability. So we're still low communication speed with brain computer interfaces, but we're really trying to increase that. Um, and we think like this training, this idea of training individuals over multiple sessions, multiple repetitions can really support that and, and evidence from other practices uh, is evidence of that. So real, real, real time feedback and continual high dose therapy for, for, for participants will, will certainly improve accuracies. So there are multiple driving forces around neurotechnology, people with restricted abilities, aging population, uh, health and wellness, and, and, and many others. So, so we have certainly a lot of interest in the, in the area and we're already, we're already seeing the, the, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you folks. Uh, really appreciate the time given for this presentation. And I would like to thank my, my funders as well. Um, uh, lots of these, including the Alan Turing Institute for the, the Turing AI Fellowship. And what you're seeing here um, is basically a slice to what we call the perception action loop. Namely, the idea that your brain, to make actions, to make decisions, to live, needs to perceive information, process that somehow chemically and biologically, uh, learn from that at some synapses, and then tell the motor system to move some muscles, because it's only through the movement of muscles that you can interact with the world, be it to eat, to speak, to walk, or to talk. So really, that's the only channel of communication that your healthy brain has. And if we look now at how we build agents, AI agents that can exhibit behavior, the picture looks very similar. We have an agent, so an AI system at the top that issues some actions that impact the world, and then this is then processed to the sensory system of the agent that senses the state and flows back into the agent. So, you know, so far the pictures look very similar, but now there's a divergence when we're asking who is actually AI made for? So at the bottom left, you see the typical interaction that we humans had before AI. A human is interacting with a human, and uh, the two need to work out how to you know, be cooperative or competitive or in any other way of interaction. And in the top right, you're seeing how many AI systems are designed at the moment. AI systems for AI systems. AI systems playing video games with AI systems, or AI systems controlling manufacturing setting. There is no human there. But what I'm interested in is systems where the agent or the AI interacts with the human, and whether basically one system affects the other or that one system instructs the other doesn't matter to me at this point. And so basically, there are a number of challenges that I'm setting up to understand how can we actually learn uh, and know what the brain can and cannot do. And so one of the first challenges that we looked at was the ability of AI systems to uh, learn to cooperate with humans. And so one of the big challenges in AI system, if you look at interactive systems, deep reinforcement learning systems, is that they need a lot of data. And so I'm showing you here a simple game that we invented, that we have an AI and a human play on a robot. And it's basically a balance board game. And what you're seeing here is that the robot controls a balance board and can basically, uh, by tilting, make a ball move over the surface. Now comes the trick. We wanted to enforce that the human and the AI learn to control the robot together and that the goal to put the ball into the distant corner into the, into the hole can only be achieved if both systems work together. And so what we did is we basically allowed the human just control one degree of freedom and the robot to control the other degree of freedom. So the two systems have to cooperate. And to my surprise, when we ran this experiment, we figured, hmm, what happens? So here you see, oops, a human playing this, and at the start, the robot is start trying to learn with the human, and it sort of takes ages uh, for them to be able to cooperate, and then they eventually timed out. Uh, after 20 minutes, they're achieving this solution together uh, it takes a bit, maybe there's a bit of chance involved, uh, but they eventually get there. But already after 40 to 50 minutes, uh, you can now see how quickly 
Uh, it works. Sorry, I'm jumping to the wrong part of the video here. Let's jump here. That should be it. Oops. This is the video where it happens, where they're working together. And so, ooh, maybe I jumped to the wrong part of the video. The, the key thing is here, they achieved the goal. Now, what we can now do is basically do a form of brain surgery. We can train an AI to work with one human player and then see whether the same AI can work with another player. And that's what we're showing in these videos here. And sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't. It turns out it works always then well when the humans are compatible in their playing strategy between each other, that when the AI learns to cooperate with one human, it can learn to cooperate with other uh, human players that operate in the same way. And so that's an important lesson already because now we can really study how humans cooperate with humans because we have an AI player and an AI mindset that we can completely study and analyze. I'm like a human player whose brain we cannot cut open. So that's quite interesting. But let's, let's push these questions further. What can humans actually really do? So um, a few years ago, um, uh, a few friends of mine and I had the question is, is there a limit to what the human brain can actually control in terms of movement? Where can we push these things? And again, we are answering this with a question where we built an experiment for humans to perform. And so if you think about embodiment of technology, if you look back into you know, ancient history, uh, like in the Buddhist religions or in, you know, uh, into the recent Spider-Man movies, you see this multi-limbed uh, people or beings. And so the question is, can we build a multi-limbed human and see whether they can learn to control that? So a few, uh, two years ago, we started building a system that is effectively a robotic third thumb. And so that's a thumb that sits on the opposite side uh, of your regular thumb. And there's a small AI that learns how to control the thumb based on the commands that you give. And we put this on human piano players. And we ask them, learn to play the piano with your extra thumb. And to my surprise, they were actually not only able to use that extra thumb. Uh, after a roughly, again, 40 to 50 minutes playing, they were actually able to play with all 11 fingers uh, piano and pieces uh, naturally. We then went on to study in more detail, you know, what are the conditions that allow a piano player to learn to use um, this extra thumb, the multi-extra limb they have, and find out that we can actually predict which human brains are best suited for learning an extra, uh, uh, learning to crawl an extra skill. And the interesting thing, it's not about your piano playing ability, it's about your dexterity abilities. And so this really shows that you know, there are a lot of new ways we can engage with studying how the brain works um, by doing experiments. And so this brought me to, to very recently, uh, to a very interesting problem in general that you face in AI, about explainability and trust. So the classic example here with this boy being shown to a pattern recognition system and the deep neural network says, oh, it's not a boy, it's a clog, and you don't know why. So people are talking a lot about finding solutions for explainability in AI. Uh, you know, people talk about decision trees, uh, you know, showing the feature importance of what elements in an image or, or in data is important. And people talk a lot about neurosymbolic learning uh, because sort of it mimics the way the human brain reasons. And so this is wonderful. You have all these computer scientists and AI researchers going out and inventing new ways about how information uh, from an AI system should be explained to a human so that they actually act on it in, in the way you would want the people to act. The challenge is, to date, no one has systematically developed a method for measuring how good an explanation in AI is. And so what we do is usual in the lab, we come up with a simple experiment. And I'm just showing you that in a minute. So basically, uh, we give people a task. Say I show you a photo and ask you, how old is the person in that photo? And then basically on this axis here, that's age, that's the top blue line. And then you know, I ask you, what do you think, how old is that person? And then the person, uh, the subject, you know, says it's that old. And then I say, OK, thank you for your guess. And now I'm telling you what the AI is saying. And I show you here what the AI has said. And I can now, for example, also display an explanation why the AI did that or provide other information. And then I ask the human subject another time. 
So what is your final prediction now that you know what the AI thinks? And so people will then typically, uh, you know, maybe change their mind. And then they will say, oh, the age is this point here, the dark blue arrow. And so we can now measure for the first time by how much their uh, decision has shifted due to being exposed to the explanation by the AI. And we can have a number and we can measure things. And so what we wanted to know is some very basic things. Does it matter how good the AI is at predicting the age of people, for example? Does it matter whether the explanation is good or bad or not provided? And does it matter, for example, whether people have been exposed to the explanations while they were trained on solving the task, when we gave them examples at the start? And to, to reduce a bunch of numbers very simply, what we found is something very startling. So first of all, we find that that's natural. If people see that an AI is good at predicting age, well, then we trust the good AI more than a system, an AI that has been poorly trained on the data. That's good. You trust uh, systems that are good. Now comes the kicker, though. When you have an AI with good predictions, and I give you an explanation, then you trust that system more than a system that does not provide explanations. But, and here comes the kicker now, at this point, it doesn't matter whether the explanation is actually a good explanation or a random explanation that has potentially nothing to do with the prediction. Humans were equally swayed by the fact, simply by the presence of an explanation. And similarly, if you look at a bad AI, so that's systematically performing badly, you find that we trust bad predictions if we provide a good explanation or a no explanation more than if you provide a system with a bad explanation. So this sets up a number of conundrums about how we should think about building AI systems that should be explainable. And for us, the current challenge is, and I think here you can arrive for our funding, is to now to start thinking of building AI systems where humans are in the loop, and now we can, for the first time, measure the trust that people have, that they can learn interactively. We have a trust gradient on which we can effectively do gradient ascent to improve a system's smartness. And with that, I want to come to an end and highlight that all three projects were done by a wonderful postdoc, Ali Shafti, who is on the market, and I hope uh, you will want to hire him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aldo. That was brilliant. Come join me and we can do a couple of questions. Um, I've got Slido open in front of me, so if anyone wants to submit a question for Aldo, please do now. We've got a couple of minutes. Hopefully we can squeeze in a few. Um, we've got a question already from Anna, Anna Maria, who asks, could artificial intelligence be inspired by humans? Would human processes such as sleep offer valuable insight to advancing AI? Ah, beautiful question. I think, um, I mean, there's a whole branch of machine learning called imitation learning where you can say we're, uh, AIs are learning to imitate humans. But I think the question of inspiration is more than that. It's providing motivation. And again, here, they're in reinforcement learning uh, avenues. So this is a form of AI that does learn interactively, what I showed you at the start. And here you can, I think, think about ways where, if you have also human players in, in this element, that they're basically mutually reinforcing each other if things go well, or mutually dampening each other if things don't go well. I want to ask a question um, based this final piece of research that you showed us absolutely fascinating about the explainability and kind of the, the, the idea of this trust gradient. Um, I wonder if, you know, have you thought about how looking into research as to how humans trust machines, how different is that or how, um, I guess, comparable is that to research around how humans trust humans? So that's, that's great. And so you can start looking at the literature and it's a huge literature about trust and what engenders trust and all these different factors. Um, and then we're becoming sort of going slowly into the social sciences. Yeah. The problem is me as a scientist, as a neuroscientist, but also me as an AI researcher, I'm interested in things that I can directly measure. So some of these things I will need to verify by actually measuring the trust shift mm. in measuring this effect. And so uh, we've built this whole experiment on an online system. So we have, you know, literally thousands of people running these experiments. Mm. So I may have an answer on you how all the sorts of factors uh, can influence people. I mean, of course, I'm going to ask that question because I'm a social scientist and I'm interested in trust in science. So, uh, but I was watching that thinking there must be something here that you can think about when thinking about trust and expertise and, and so on and yeah. so forth. Um, we've got another question through from Alice. What techniques do you use to explain your AI? That's very good. 
so in this, in this simple example, we simply choose a system that provides feature importance. So it provides a recommendation and then says why. So for example, if you're predicting the age of people, it shows you which part of the face were particularly important. We have also different tasks where we're predicting the, gra the, brain, uh, the, the grade of students based on numerical information, so not just image information that's not present there. And, and there we're saying, oh, these and these things are important for predicting the grade of people. So it's a very simple way of explaining. There are many other ways, but this is just to show that um, we can start measuring the impact of an explanation. And the bizarre thing is that a bad explanation or a good explanation doesn't matter on the impact. You know, that, again, that says it's, it's actually a human problem and not a computer science problem that we need to look at. Definitely. Um, another question from the audience, this one from Henry. Can an AI learn creative processes such as songwriting through reinforcement learning? Another beautiful question. Um, and we had a whole workshop on that a few years ago called creativity. And um, it depends what we believe human creativity actually is. Mm -hmm. I think it's a form of random exploration and then the specific skill of the artist. It's not just the confidence in being able to talk about the art, but also to sort of guide this random exploration process. Other people who look at creativity scientifically, so to speak, in humans, think it's actually there may be something extra, but I've never seen that something extra. But we had a guy from Spotify Labs in Parrots, and they basically took all the best songs that people are listening to and created the super song with all the elements of it, and then they played it back, and no one liked it. So there is something to this exploration process uh, that we need to better understand. Final question that I'm going to sneak in, uh, which is mine. What are you kind of most excited about right now in terms of your work? What do, how should people who are interested in what you're interested in keep following along? What should they be looking into? So looking at our Twitter feed can help. And, okay. and I, I think my challenge is I find a lot of things interesting as long as they have to do about how AI can empower humans. I don't want to do AI for AI's sake. Okay. It's AIs for us. Amazing. Aldo, thank you so much for joining us. Um, that was an absolutely brilliant presentation and I think a really lovely way to finish off our In the Lab um, stage for today. Um, and in fact, as I said, that does bring us to the end of today's content here on In the Lab. We've got another full day tomorrow packed with amazing um, content around what's actually happening in terms of research and action surrounding AI and data science. We've got a lot of discussions around even just the process of doing research a whole panel on PhDs, for instance. Um, so do come join us again tomorrow. Um, but other than that, last thing for me to say is a big thank you for joining us and I'll see you in the morning.